Good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Sawick. As the director of the UBC School of Nursing, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening, our 51st annual Marion Woodward Lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we work and live on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Musqueam, the tsleil the Squamish, and the Stolo Nations. The Mr. and Mrs. P.A. Woodward Foundation has generously supported the Marion Woodward Lecture since 1969. Um, although Marion Woodward actually never allowed her name to be used on any of the other sort of philanthropic grants um, that the foundation did, she met with Beth McCann, our director at the time, and she agreed to give the lectureship her name. In fact, she actually attended that first lecture and then held a tea afterwards at her home. Tonight is the capstone public event of our centenary year in celebration of our School of Nursing. You know, over the past year, we've been celebrating just a, a long set of events um, to celebrate our first 100 years. Launched in 1919, this school introduced the first university-based baccalaureate nursing degree in Canada and indeed in the British Commonwealth. This groundbreaking initiative in nursing education actually marked a new era for nursing across this country and across the world, and it has continued to propel the advancements of nurses and healthcare in Canada. We're privileged to have a foundation of generations of wise, forward-thinking, determined nurses who have made each of these past 100 years a success here at UBC. Tonight's lecture is particularly timely. We've spent the last year celebrating the past and our 100 years, but we also are looking forward to the next 100 years. The future holds so many opportunities and challenges that are really um, just made for the kinds of skills that nurses have. We're exceptionally well positioned to actually lead in some of these issues. And while future predicting is a difficult science as best, this year's Marion Woodward Lecture keynote speaker has given considerable thought to how nursing may best play a role, at least in co-creating the not too distant future. I'd like to invite my colleague at the UBC School of Nursing, our Associate Director of Research, Dr. John Olive, to introduce our year's keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Booth. Um, welcome. Um, so to introduce Richard, I'll read a little bit of a spiel that you've got in front of you. Just check my reading. Dr. Richard Booth is an Associate Professor in the School of Nursing at Western Ontario. His program of research seeks to explore the relationships between human and technological interactions within healthcare and educational contexts. But I know, ladies and gentlemen, you would like to really know the facts about Richard. So I've been spending some time with Richard. And here's what I've found out. He once barbecued for 26 hours. Like straight, not a career in barbecue, you know, that's all at one time. I think that's pretty good, I was, I was captured right there. The tweets about Richard learning everything he knows about information technology as coming from my portfolio and my career are not true. Richard substanti substantiated that, substantiated that. The other things that you should know about Richard, he likes scotch. And so at dinner, we were talking about scotch, but I don't understand scotch, but he likes the smoky scotch. Just saying. He's also on sabbatical, which makes his presence here even more enormous because he's taken time out of what's meant to be a time where you reflect on all things past and all things future. And so he's taken a lot of time out of his busy life. And he's got two children at home, 2.5 years of age and five years of age, who are missing him. We may have had dinner in a department store where he could have bought a present for them, but we were on the men, menswear section, so I couldn't do that. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Richard Booth. Oh. Well, thank you so much for the warm introduction and the invitation uh, to uh, present today on a topic that I'm very passionate about and hope that I can convey some of that passion to you all tonight to really explore where the future is going, to really take a journey into the future of nursing and the future of healthcare. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a thought journey down 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I'm not actually quite, oh my goodness. And you wanna talk about a slide deck that if you hit the wrong button, you go forward real quick. <laughs> I can't stop it. That's awesome. I have no idea why it's scrolling everything. Whoa, look at that. Let's try that again. That was great. You know, I don't, I used to actually, um, when I, we used to do kind of like presentations and stuff, especially at informatics conferences, I always found it kind of funny. You know Microsoft Clippy? It, it kiboshed so many different people's presentations because it just kind of got in the way of everything. So I'm just not going to touch the scroll thing because that apparently really makes things happen. So let's talk about your day to day. Your day to day is full of things. It's full of technology. It's full of overwhelming things. And what this kind of leads to is, like, you know, uh, almost a normalization towards technology, a normalization towards current day activities. So we're going to really focus in on stuff in this immediate part of this presentation that really gets at, you know, how far we've come in such a short amount of time. So let's go back about 40 years. Here's 1981. There's when Bill Cosby still was okay. Um, your 20 meg hard drive that was a backpack, you know, this is a 95 megabyte PowerPoint file. So this PowerPoint file is like, uh, like degrees larger than the, this hard drive from 1985. And I really love the CompuServe early internet advertising. It says, someday from the comfort of your own home, you'll be able to shop and bank electronically and instantly update, uh, read news wires and analyze the performance of stocks. And you'll play bridge with three strangers in LA, Chicago, and Dallas. Wow, and wear white pleather apparently also. <laughs> we move into the mid and early 90s and you have Peter Mandras there with his segment on the national, the internet, not internet, the internet. And you know, it was really interesting to watch that and you can pull it up on YouTube and see what it was like back then in the early neophyte kind of stages of the internet. And you know, 42 days to download a file over some, you know, ratio FTP site. Clippy, ICQ, the early beginnings of Google, and this little company called Netflix that would like, you know, mail you a VHS cassette. What a, my blockbuster card's perfectly fine. Netflix, I don't, they'll never catch on. So, you know, we move into the late 90s, early 2000s. Some of you probably own this Blackberry. That's an 8700. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? It had Bluetooth. Oh, Blackberry took a step back and was like, we're gonna give it Bluetooth. And that was a major security breach thing that they were all cognizant about. The Facebook from 2004, that's the first screenshot. Wikipedia, 2001. Yeah, there's your Wikipedia page in the bottom center screen. I remember when I saw that, I'm like, common editable encyclopedia, that'll never catch on. <laughs> yep. So we move into the late 2000s, and then we have the first YouTube video there in the bottom left. He's worth $140 million now because he sold it to Google. Uh, remember the netbook phase? That came and went at a blink of an eye. And then your iPad, which has been mentioned a few times since some of those six minute presentations we just had uh, two hours earlier, is less than 10 years old at this point. Let that sink in. Your iPad is less than 10 years old. And we bring it to current day contemporary times. I was walking through the airport and I saw a lot of women with long hair seemingly talking to themselves. But they're not because they have earbuds in. So you think about something from 20 years ago being transported in the future, seeing people talking to themselves in full on conversations, walking. This is where we're living. You know, Apple Card, I'll speak about that in a second, is a bank run by Apple now backed onto another financial industry. When Apple has its own banking system that it's opened for you. We have the conglomerate, the mishmash of social media sites that you can swipe left, swipe right, like, up, down, what have you. Talk to agents, non-human, that respond to you in real time, natural language. You have drones fly past, and it takes me 54 hours to drive home to London, Ontario from here, because my Waze app told me that upon landing here. <laughs> and a guy named Elon Musk who decided, or giggles, to fling his car into space. Like, that is the timeline that we currently exist within. So what is this all done? What has this done to us? 
If that's not a trip back to memory lane to up to current state, I'm not sure what I can do to really impress upon you, that we have really normalized a lot of technology that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. And Nicholas Agar wrote a book called The Skeptical Optimist in 2015. He denotes this hedonic normalization, where it's a process where we tend to form goals and interpret experiences as per appropriate the environment that we are in that kind of go over time or maturate over time. So essentially what that means is stuff that you grew up using, technology, whatever it might be, gets added to your baseline, your baseline of experiences. And as you grow, you kind of remember what life was like before, but you're just happy you have it now. But your kids, oh man, they don't know. They get a bit of your baseline, but then they're like, why are you using that old thing? Why are you impressed by the internet? Hasn't it always existed? And it's not their fault. They just never know. So all the stuff at Pierre I've used, but if I ask my five-year-old how to dial a rotary phone, they're like, no, phones don't look like that, Dad. They look very much like this. Because my baseline has been transferred to her in only a little micro sense. Her baseline is completely different. So it's a part to me talking to my undergrad second year nursing students, trying to tell them what like getting a journal article was prior to Google Scholar and PDF. It's like, well, first you gotta go to the library. Like physically, yeah, you, you gotta physically go there. And then you gotta go find a computer at one of the banks that you type in the symbol using some sort of search algorithm string that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, and then you gotta go find the article down in the basement and photocopy it at 64% to get two pages on one. And the blank stares of incomprehension that come across. Heaven forbid I even try to ask them, you know, or tell them what the red books were, right? Like that's just not even in the cards. So. What has this normalization done? Well, Agar's kind of interpretation of this hedonic normalization means that he sees generations as this really important demarcation between how people normalize technology. Each generation will normalize something different and create their own baselines. This is where I kind of disagree from his interpretation because generations take a time. It's like a chunk of people over a certain definable amount of time that have common like experiences. Well, over the last 10 years, a lot of things have happened where to have a common unified experience over a chunk of time in 10 years with the technology rapid evolution we have becomes troublesome and cumbersome. So I want you to think of the car that you probably drove here. There's probably a few who have electric cars, but the majority of you probably drive some sort of internal combustion engine car. You drive that car off the lot, half its value goes away, depreciates. That car ain't getting any better. It's gonna burn gas and fall apart and you're gonna replace it in six years when you have a head gasket blow on it. That's pretty much the planned obsolescence of an internal combustion vehicle. Versus say a Tesla where it appreciates in value. You heard me, the car appreciates in value. You wanna talk about an inversion of something that's physical because they install hardware on it that can be updated and upgraded and become better and smarter. So most of your Teslas right now have actually some pretty advanced autopilot, border on autonomous driving capability, but rate limited through software. So when that software gets better, they just update your car. So when you buy a Tesla, you buy, depending on how much you pay, you get access to a percentage of the battery. So if you only pay the baseline for the model, you only get a portion of the battery. You pay the full amount, you get the whole battery. But your car has the same battery. You are being rate limited by software and how much money you pay. So think of it that way from an internal combustion engine car, that you have a car, oh, you only get to use half the fuel tank. This is the model of the 2.0 world we're in, where your car can get better over time. Elon Musk pushed a button in San Fran out in California and made cars have extended range in Florida because there was a hurricane coming. So he took some you know, beneficence and said, hey, you can drive further now because there's a hurricane coming. Over the air, instantly. That is your normalization. That has just happened without you even blinking an eye. Everything I've just said currently exists. So when we start thinking about what is conscious versus what is unconscious normalization, I want you to think of it this way. The rate of change, the rate of innovation that we've seen in the last, say, 10 years, our only defense mechanism is this passive normalization. We just can't keep up. So you just kind of go, oh, yeah, cool, and nod and glance at some new innovation that within itself evolved itself. That cell phone you have has evolved itself three or four times over due to software upgrades before you have replaced it in the two year window. So you can't even keep track of the device you bought because the device you bought a year ago is fundamentally different a year later. It has evolved within itself. So you can see when you start going down this rabbit hole, this rabbit hole goes really far deep because what you have unconsciously normalized into your everyday, day-to-day -day actions of technology are really important. And you notice how I haven't even talked about healthcare yet. 
Because until you understand what is currently in your societal repertoire that's been unconsciously normalized, you can't even think about what's going to happen in healthcare and nursing in the future. So I'm going to play this. It's going to catch us up about 40 years of just basic stuff that you would do kind of to, you know, live to type. So you can see. Vancouver is really telling of how much I've normalized because in that rate of time all this stuff has happened these are just clippings from the last year or two you know when you have driverless cars that have killed people you have Amazon you know listening oh they always said oh yeah believe me Amazon Alexa is not listening to you there's no one no human there oh yeah oh, from quality permit yeah we have thousands of people listening to your conversations notwithstanding that you know, $70 billion were lost when Cambridge Analytica broke for, for Facebook. They just walked that off like a leg cramp. That was a rounding error to them. And did anyone delete their Facebook accounts? No, no. We now live in this world where you can't keep up with what is going on. We have normalized so much into the background that this is 10 million Facebook friends right now and their connection. You can connect. We are, you, if you have a Facebook account, are 3.6 degrees of separation away from anyone on the Facebook network. We have never lived in a world where you can connect with 1.5 billion active registered users in three and a half degrees of separation. So I think if you want to talk to someone, you're only three and a half degrees of separation away at the max. It makes that seven degrees of separation game that you might have played seem kind of, kind of quaint and distant in the past now. The Internet of Things, you go into the, any Best Buy, you will find a quarter to a third of your Best Buy store just on how to home automate you how to connect things to the internet that then work for you. The fact that I can see my kids walk in 3,000 kilometers away on my phone right now, I have no idea how that data got to me, but it does. I can have my robot drive around and clean my floor. I can change my thermostat from here. I can do a lot of things that five years ago were still bordered on either cost prohibitive or theoretical. You have 100 million Alexa devices that have been sold in roughly the last five years. Tesla shows you the power of the Internet of Things in terms of things being connected to the Internet in every way. And then you start to see stuff like this. Now, this was impressive five years ago. This made the front page of Reddit, for anyone who's a Redditor. It was the most upvoted thing for about a day, which is saying a lot on Reddit. LaGuardia Airport replaced their minimum wage cashiers with machines. Do you know how many machines I've touched in my time between London, Ontario, and here in the last 30 some odd hours? that replaced a human? I touched a lot of them. I used a lot of them, and I preferred a few of them, too. That a and W's at Pearson, that's my go-to. Do I talk to the person, or do I hit the screen? I talk to a lot of labor union audiences, and I just close that up front. I get a lot of hisses. But still, it's true. You know, you use a bank machine. That's a form of automation. We are now at a place where automation, artificial intelligence, and things that we have normalized in our day-to-day, -day, we don't even see anymore. Sophia is a robot that was granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia in 2017. I can't make that up. Uh, now, that's probably de devaluing what it is to be human in a big way, in a marketing thing for the country also, but still, it needed a visa to go to a different country because they gave it citizenship. Yeah, yeah, it's getting weird. So when you have things like this that are occurring and you start looking at news clippings, especially over the last five years, where scientists are saying, yeah, those killer robots that are probably coming, we probably should uh, ban autonomous killing machines. Like, this is a narrative and a liner that I never thought I would hear in my professional life, but yet here we are. When governments are falling behind automation and we have stuff like this, that Boston Dynamics come over every four months and just kind of slightly impresses me and terrifies me, and it's always with a hockey stick. Have you noticed that? They're always beating this poor robot with a hockey stick. And the, the image above, I really quite like. You know, if anyone's ever built anything from Ikea, you know, with your partner, it's like a soul relationship building exercise. If you can build that bookshelf in like 
you get it done, you can probably get married. Well, they, they built this robot here that could read the instructions, and on its second try, about 20 minutes in, it built the chair. Yeah, so, you know, if a machine can read the instructions and build it, that's a pretty complex human-like thing that it's been doing. This is eons ago in the robotics language and world, but it was this 2014 when Hitchbot, McMaster University, built a hitchhiking robot that traveled across Canada. It was sadly decapitated in Philadelphia. Yeah, but see, everyone just laughs at a decapitation of a non-human agent. Yeah, let that sink in a bit. This thing had personality. This thing was transported. People took care of this thing. And it was murdered, can I say that, in Philadelphia? We are kind of entering a new place where even my vernacular, I'm qualifying and changing. You have a robot here, and you will see this in the United States in some malls. And if you go to some places in Vegas, you'll see these security bots driving around. One ran over a child. They changed its algorithm, so kind of like my little miniature curio out there, but much bigger. It's a security robot, so you know one person could command a fleet of these things and drive around and tell presence and see it. Another one drowned itself by accident in a, in a fountain in a in a mall. But you know, and there's been human on robot violence, as you can see. And we have new areas of things that we never even thought would be possible. Like what happens when an Amazon robot goes rogue and injures a bunch of people because of bear spray? Who's liable for that? Is it Amazon? Is it a robot? Things are the questions, once again, I didn't think I'd have to address in my personal professional life, but here we are. And then you have people vandalizing self-driving things because, I don't know, we want to stop progress, so we'll just beat up the faceless, faceless car. So when MIT Press is writing things like how to robot-proof your job, I'm starting to take a signal here that there's something happening, especially in the last five, maybe ten years. That is much bigger than me. It's much bigger than... Maybe individually we need to work together to figure out how we're going to actually think about this. And is this oversold? It probably is in many respects. But keep in mind, everything I've shown you currently exists, and whether you're aware of it or not, you've already passively normalized it into your day-to-day. -day. You've just accepted it as a defense mechanism because you can't keep up. And if you're a fan of T-Swift and gone to one of her concerts, you probably had facial recognition used on you. Because that exists, and the last year that has been something that's become into the forefront with a lot of the protests around the world and facial recognition. San Francisco banned it as a city. When we're having things like that, and oh, YVR, to use it in the Nexus kiosk. So if you've ever gone through CBP, American Pre-Customs, and you like stand here and wait for your photo to be taken, ooh, your data, your, your face, your facial recognition now just been added deterministically with your passport to things into the future that could be potentially used. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of asymmetric warfare, grill warfare that's been occurring in, in riots and things like that. That's a, um, that's a facial recognition tower that was cut down by protesters in Hong Kong. The Economist has a really great article, a great series on the surveillance state. And then you start to see MIT Press again, how to kick facial recognition out of your town. It's become so consumer level that I saw at least three articles about facial recognition in Canadian landscape in the last week. This is a bar in London, England. The consumer level of this has fallen so much that a company has created facial recognition to queue lines going to the bar. If anyone's been to a club or a bar, you know that it's an art form and a contact sport to get up to the front to give your money to get the server to notice you so you can get your drink. Well, this, this, this watches the crowd, and if you cut a line, you go rogue, it forces you to the back of the queue. Yeah! for the win for the little person who can't get their beer because it got pushed all the way by the big person. Consumer level. This is a company that now currently exists. So when you start thinking about these sorts of things, we're just going down the rabbit hole, resetting your baseline of what currently exists. When you have Twitter bots, Russian troll bots, this is an article in a pretty you know, prestigious journal where they tracked the influence of bots on the vaccine debate, swaying the vaccine debate. You have people writing papers about taking your social media presence and linking it to a healthcare encounter. Top left, 4,000 people were asked going into the merge department. Hey, would you like to add your Facebook account information to your merge record? 1,000 said yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's a BMJ. You can go look it up, linking social media and medical records. So when you have a quarter of a population, and there's like, like, like level three folks in here. Like you're, you're not feeling real good in the emerge. And people are willingly linking their healthcare record with Facebook. And if that didn't scare you anything, what about Cambridge Analytica? 
Remember, no, one, no one's deleted their accounts. This is from one of their execs. Today in the United States, we have somewhere close to four to 5,000 data points on every individual. So we model the personality, the personality of every adult in the United States, some 230 million people. So that means a data point and an algorithm. So I want you to think of like matrix, a representation of data of you, if you have a social media platform, currently exists somewhere and is being aggregated. You exist, and for whoever was here in my previous, you exist in the interstitial space between what is digital and physical. You exist as a digital form, but also as a physical being. And that's all being used for you, with you, and against you. Your access to the internet is a personalized marketing strategy. Everything you've ever done in the last five, six years, really on the internet, has been tracked. And really, I just was joking when we walked through the Nordstrom's there, that you know, having marketing apps that actually listen to your phone and talk to your phone. You'd be sitting in front of the TV and a subsonic ping from a commercial will talk to your phone and in a non-creepy 24-hour window later, whatever advertising was there will now pop up to your phone. That type of technology exists and has been scaled and used. But most people didn't really ever realize that. Once again, the passive normalization. And it also, Google and Facebook, they all know anything you bought because they all have licensing agreements with MasterCard and Visa and things like that and can share data back and forth. And you know, I guarantee you, one of your distant relatives, maybe if you removed, has spit in a tube and mailed it off to 23andMe or a like genetics company. Your future crime, because you left DNA at the scene, you've already been found out. Yeah, yeah, because some relative you don't even know about has just busted you. That happened with the Golden Gate Killer there in San Francisco. They found it through Ancestry.com. They found a match with someone who had genetic um, similarities and was able to reverse engineer using this data where this person probably lived and was able to track them down. You know, because they would never do anything bad with my, oh, yeah. Um, so whether it's working with a pharmaceutical company, which I don't see inherently as a bad thing, even though 23andMe has over a million genotypes in their, in their database, or working at the FBI, we now live in a world where that kind of stuff can happen. I'm waiting for the first plagiarized automated bot term paper to show up into my inbox. And I think it already has. Yeah, I think it already has because there's companies you can pay to do that. But just last week, this nice little open AI, um, if you have enough computing software and uh, knowledge, you can just do it yourself. It just writes you papers. So that little paragraph down on the bottom, it looks like a second year, kind of clunky, but good enough term like wording of an undergrad student. That, both these things were written by, by robots. We need to live in a world where your creative abilities to write, your creative abilities to be a person are starting to get kind of shifted. All those people up there don't exist. Those are manufacturers. Those are renders through AI. Now, the cats are kind of slightly terrifying. You can see that our AI to produce a cat image is not as good as it, say, would be a human. But that means that none of those people exist. And if you want to spend some time tomorrow not doing what you're supposed to be doing, go type into thispersondoesnotexist.com and keep hitting the refresh button. And every quarter second later, you will be rendered a person who doesn't exist that is generated through facial algorithms and AI. That person does not exist you see on the screen. So just to finalize the you know, kind of terrifying aspect of deep fakes, as what they're called. You see the Mona Lisa is actually currently doing stuff. Um, any picture that arguably is out there can be turned into movement, can be turned into motion. And when I play kind of this one here. I put a poem about what it feels like to be an impressionist. Just watch and listen. Is anything more sad and lame, contemptible, beneath disdain, in short, provoking of disgust than being an impressionist. A third rate, even fourth rate skill. The definition of cheap thrill. Like watching farm equipment rust is watching an impressionist. Relic from a distant day that long since should have office. died away. Or Parks and Rec. Um, yeah. That's your normalized world you live in. That's the world that you have passively normalized because that's your only defense mechanism because the rate of change has happened so quickly that you, there's just no way for you to keep up. So what does our future look like? What are we gonna do? Well, my main thesis point for today after getting down that rabbit hole is we can only move forward unless 
we take some really hard decisions and hard thoughts here. We really need to reconceptualize what our relationship is with a lot of this emerging technology and really think about whether we could or should use it to evolve the modern day nursing role. And I'm thinking right now that we're not doing enough of that and we're probably not moving fast enough. A couple years ago I was interviewed by the Canadian nurse in terms of this topic and I gave some of my insights and they were a little bit more, they were a little bit more edgy at that point and they've rounded since then as the whole discipline kind of has in terms of it's not just going to be like full on replacement, there's going to be a lot more kind of augmentation which I'll get into in a second. This comment was left there um, that I saw a couple months later after it was posted. I'm going to read it a lot I think it's important. All I see is this new way for employers to cut nurses front line to say a buck. Nothing replaces years of experience of a nurse sitting at triage knowing that something isn't right despite the answers to the question. Nothing replaces years of experience of a bedside nurse to know something isn't right. And registered nurses are taught to critically think. Robots don't think. They use algorithms. I 100% agree with everything that likely a merge nurse said. But what it shows to me is we haven't evolved our relationship with this technology. We're holding on to something that is probably not as contemporary as it needs to be. And this thought experiment I really refined with my second year undergrads who are essentially 18 or 19 years old. This is not them, but it could be them. I sit and stand in front of 150 of them. They all have their MacBook Pros. They have an iPhone in their pocket. They've never known a world without Wi-Fi. And they have never used a photocopier. I asked my class of 150, how many of you used a photocopier? Two people out of 150 put their hand up. Yeah, yeah. Now remember, normalization, Photocopier is not important to them because they've never known paper, right? So why would they need to know? And they have a whole new vernacular like yeet and lit and lift and other, I don't, I don't have some. <laughs> we do some thought experiments where I get them to come up with ideas of the future in our informatics class we have and we get to vet them. So green means upvote, yellow means neutral, and red means downvote. So the numbers are how many people. So I'm just kind of going to go through the ones with the arrows here. That future nurses should be educated program robots. No. Next one down, our curriculum needs to change in order to incorporate technology. That is clearly happening. Most people, yes. Um, future role could involve a robotic partnership. Yeah, yeah, okay. Next one down, robots could be programmed with emotion. Oh, empathetic responses, caring. No, 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 no good. Someday we may be advocating for robots and technology. Yes. Okay, does anyone notice uh, like uh, in incongruence with this, this kind of, like we know it's coming, but don't let it come. I want to talk about the relationship. These are 19 year olds who have never known a world without the internet, who are terrified of the future. This is clearly happening. And we haven't evolved, if they haven't evolved their relationship, where is the rest of our profession? So here's some movement and ideas. I just do some quick cynical searches here to kind of figure out where things are at. And you can see here that between like 2016 and 18, you had a pretty good kind of hockey stick curve in the number of hits on social media. Artificial intelligence doubled. Uber, everything, the Uber and six, the 61 there from 2006, it, it was a German word for big. So it's not actually like the model of economy that is Uber now. You can see it kind of grew in 2018. Well, let's just do a year, shall we? Wow, that's a big curve there for social media. Oh, look at artificial intelligence. That doubled. Uber, uh, that's exponential. Machine learning, hmm, that's sizable. And internet things, that's sizable too. We are now at a place where that hockey stick curve and these topics, this is just raw signal searches, this is results, is actually starting to become impressive that this is a topic that didn't exist really within our vernacular five years ago, but now does. So how do we focus in on what is important in nursing and healthcare when we have so much background scenery to look at? And there's lots of background scenery. Like we've essentially been looking at the background scenery because it's just easier to than trying to focus on something that's moving around. I'm gonna talk a little bit about healthcare. Then I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna do some other rabbit hole stuff. And then I'm gonna come back to healthcare. So just bear with me on this journey here. This exists in Canada right now. This is classical when I look at health, digital health technology. You just heard me. I just called a new model of care classical because I don't even see this as overly innovative anymore because it is a model of care delivery that is established and currently exists. From an Ontario context, can't speak from a BC, this is a service provider in Ontario. This is Maple. For $50 a pop, you can push a button on your iPhone and about a minute or so later, a physician or a nurse practitioner will pop up in a FaceTime-like application and you can talk to them and then do a consult. You need a prescription, open your mouth up. Oh yeah, it looks like strep. You can have some antibiotics. I'll send you the email. Poof, done. You can get a family plan. Yep. Acura, same deal. A lot of insurance companies use this. 
you can see there, there's a nurse practitioner. You get a bunch of different consults as part of your, in, your insurance package. And you're probably saying, hey, wait a second, wait, no, 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 50 bucks? Hey, no, that's, that's not cool. You can't do that. Universal health care. Ooh, the Canada Health Act doesn't include digital stuff or virtual things. It only touches bricks and mortar. So if it's virtual health, it's not covered by the Canadian Health Act. So these, these companies are not going away. So for right or for wrong, I'm not going to here to critique whether these companies should or shouldn't exist. I'm going to leave that to you to do. But they exist. They ain't, they're not going away. And you can see the articles in the newspapers. They're, they're everywhere now. They're everywhere. That model of care currently exists. And I guarantee you it will be bigger. Because Kaiser in the States has been doing it for a long time. Over half of their consults and half their patient transactions are digital. And this is from a couple years ago. It's starting to happen like that a little bit. You have Babylon here where it's, it's you know, provincially funded. We have OTN in Ontario, which is provincially funded. But you have these other forces that are now doing it for profit because they can't. And if you want to talk about splitting policy hairs, I guarantee you these companies are really savvy and they will. So for right or for wrong, I'm not going to bother trying to unpack that. It's going to leave it to you. There are people in this, this audience who have, have researched this domain too. This is e shift. This is a model of home care, which I think is really quite fascinating, where it decenters the nurse but amplifies their abilities. So the delegating nurse never physically sees the patient. They sit behind a computer and delegate acts to a non registered healthcare provider, like a PSW, who then does all the care actions at the home for palliative care individuals and also some other kind of individuals they have in like complex continuing care. And you delegate it all over a phone, over an app. You can do FaceTime, like kind of video conferencing calls and stuff like that. But you now have scaled the home care nurse to be able to take care of four to six people because you can delegate to a PSW who's kind of half the cost who stays at the home from a respite care perspective. This is a model of care that exists in southern Ontario, Michigan, France, UK, a bunch of other places. It's not going to go away. It's actually provincially funded, too, in Ontario. And they're hiring. I have three graduate students who do this. They're e-shift nurses. They sit behind a computer for their shift and delegate care actions. They never physically see the patient. Maybe, uh, big, big white wall, this is another mental health kind of application where it's a virtual thing. You log on to it, there's people who watch it, and you can post comments, you can ask for help. ECBT, that's coming somewhere where you're gonna have cognitive behavioral therapy done via electronic channels. So mental health is even being, but have you noticed that the physicality we go back to interpersonal relationship, all pep lao, like that is just mm, being turned. Whether that's good or bad, once again, I'm going to leave that to you to think about. But I didn't turn on my virtual presence, telepresence robot because I didn't have enough time. But I have one online right now in London, Ontario. You can drive around my lab. Um, it kind of looks like this. It's a little bit more clunky. But this made the rounds on YouTube about, I don't know, three or four months ago where a doctor gave a terminal diagnosis to a patient over a robot. So the family member took a video of it, slammed it to YouTube, and of course he got it, that this patient who was dying of COPD, who died about a day and a half after this, was told that they were dying by a physician who drove in in a robot. Remember how I'm saying all this is classical? Because this already exists? So let's go a little bit more future forward, shall we? Um, automation. This is automation. That's the first street light there in England. That's automation. This is what a library apparently used to look like. Remember all the cue cards that you used as scrap paper for about a decade after they got rid of them? Yeah, yeah. This is McMaster University. Um, and early 80s, very rare image of Google before, it could, as it consisted of index cards and wood. So they're being kind of cheeky McMaster University libraries there. And what I thought was kind of funny and telling of the times, the McMaster University nursing account officially goes LOL. And then we slap our, our hands of our students for using text messaging language. I don't know. I thought that was kind of funny. And then we start moving further into automation of what's happening here now. Like, you know, you have Sidewalk Labs, which is essentially a smart city owned by Google within Toronto's waterfront, where everything becomes digital in terms of property, tax, presence, ability, becomes digital. Like, you can go look that up if you want to. I'm not going to be able to get into that too much today. Um, and then the bottom left here, which I thought was kind of funny, I'm like, this needs to make the cut. American robots lose jobs to Asian robots as Adidas shifts manufacturing. <laughs> Once again, the timeline, the narrative of this trajectory is something I never thought I could talk about. 
So we take a look at KPMG and Deloitte. They've been doing a lot. This is a KPMG slide here. They've been doing a lot of kind of futuristic thinking and future thought in terms of what automation is going to look like. And when we talk about automation, everyone gets terrified that the machines are going to come take my jobs. That's pretty much it. The union crowds I talk to, that's pretty much it. It's like, you can't take that task away from me. I'm like, well, someone already did. I, I hate to tell you that, but someone had already done that. But what's, besides the point, there's more than just human labor that is being decentered. Because human labor is the easiest thing to think about when you think of automation. The new hospital, the, same, the new Saint, uh, new hospital that they're building has robots built within it. You saw that, like they're taking potentially poor. Now, is that an amplification of the human role? Probably, but there's other things that come with it. The displacement of human tasks and labor is just the first place of automation. You have robotic process automation, which I'm gonna speak a little bit more. Digital labor, your digital labor of the maple NP or physician, that's digital labor. And then the really big one is that cognitive technology, like your IBM Watsons and your cognitive computing that can make decisions, human-like cognition, but not human. So the word of the day that you get to go home and, or be that person at the party is augmentation. I want you to start thinking about what augmentation is and what is and what it's not, and unfortunately the definitions are less than specific at this point. Augmentation is, if it feels like you, it is. If it's not, it's a tool. And if it allows you to achieve more than you could, it's augmentation. So you think of all the things you've been augmented by. My phone it enables me to do so much more than I could before it and it feels like it's a part of me. Because as every keynote I've ever done, I've always asked, who in the audience would like to give me your smartphone unlocked with all your passwords? There's usually one person who's like, yeah, I'll do it. But I know they really don't want to. Because it becomes part of you. It becomes part of your essence. It becomes part of everything. If you lose it or you drop it, I love it when someone drops the phone, everyone's like, oh! It's like that reaction they get, ah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So the augmentation, we've all experienced it. When we start talking about robotic process aug um, automation, augmentation of human labor, we start to scale that up a lot. We start to scale the nuance of it. So it's still early days, and we really need to figure out how it's going to work. The one thing here is, I'm not here to tell you that nursing is going to go away anytime soon, but it's going to get augmented seriously in a big way by things that we do whether it be cognitive, whether it be digital labor, whether it be some sort of task, those are gonna get changed. For right or for wrong, for good or for bad, that's really gonna be up to us to collectively decide. And like I said, it has already happened to you. Swipe left, swipe right. Let that sink in for Tinder perspective. For people who aren't familiar, don't download Tinder if you're in a happily married or relationship. Just don't do it to test out the application. But it's to find people used to be to hook up with, but now it's like a dating app, essentially. You are allowing an algorithm to predict who you should go see. The old fashioned way is you walk to the bar and you sit there and you kind of gain up enough courage and go talk to someone. An algorithm is now deciding who you will get to see. Yeah, you've been augmented by an algorithm in your relationship building. Your Nest app can tell you whether, you know, you should turn it up or down. IBM Watson's doing things around drugs where to eat, who to ensure, how much automation is gonna to be tolerated by society versus the importance of the decision. I would suggest the importance of who you're gonna date is pretty huge, and we've allowed that to be automated. We've normalized a lot, because if I, doing this presentation in the late 90s, and said, everyone's gonna meet everyone online in the future, people will be like, what are you talking about, Richard? No one meets anyone online, that's just, that's just not cool. You don't meet people like that. So you're going to hear this word probably more often, the cobots, where it's not just automation for the sake of automation. These are robots that work with you. And they're designed to work around you and with you and augment you to amplify you. Amazon's got a bunch of them going because they got seasonal rush coming up. So they need to amplify the human person, do more stuff. How you live with them, work with them, and love them. Doesn't that kind of sit with you? like indigestion. <laughs> Sophia, the citizen of Saudi Arabia already exists. I'm not going to get into that one in terms of the legalities, ethics, and whatever humanism you want to put onto that. We got a robot that passed a medical license exam. If you want to go watch a really cool TED video, go take a look at Kate Darlin's talk here about um, our emotional connection to robots. Because I saw a lot of you petting in that little curie out there or looking at her and smiling. Oh, look at the here. Yeah, yeah, you have an emotional connection to something that's not human. So what is your relationship moving in the future going to look like? Are we going to have a workforce that looks like this? 
like cobots everywhere. You're like, hey, are you taking a break with me today, robot? Like, is that where we're headed? I don't know, I hope not. Because automation's coming. And if you'll notice over the last five years or so, from 2015 to 17, the words were always replace. Now the words have softened to probably displace or change or impact. We've softened the predictions on the mass scale unemployment that automation and artificial intelligence is gonna cut. But it's still gonna do stuff. And I think nursing is pretty protected. I have a lot of like kind of anecdotal evidence and some uh, think tank research to kind of show that, which I'm not gonna get into. But that brings to forth the big question. You, know, you, you can't automate nurses, right? Can you? The stuff you do on a day-to-day, -day, that humanism, that interpersonal relation, that, that touch, we care for people. That can't be taken away from us. Or could it? Should it? Ooh. Well, there's lots of research. There's lots of for-profit companies that are going down this pathway right now. The MIT robot down here, it's a really cool robot because it watched a labor and delivery charge nurse for a couple months, read all the charts, machine learned itself, and then became really good at resource allocation. Yeah. yeah. So it's a prototype, but it shows that it can learn. Like, it's not going to help with the delivery, but it's going to resource allocate to that room in real time. Kind of like that new hospital in terms of having that central command that probably has machine learning, some artificial intelligence to help move resources around. So we start thinking about augmentation, automation. It's not that that person, that robot's gonna be able to do their blood pressure. That probably is gonna happen in the future, don't get me wrong, but not right now. It's the unseen things, it's decisions, it's the resources, the allocations. That's where it's happening. You're starting to see that happening right now. Moxie is an interesting robot. Some of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Susan McBride and Marzi, uh, Mar Mary Tais over in, uh, in Texas have been researching Moxie, where it's, it's, it's billed as a friendly robot, not to replace nurses, to help nurses. And it doesn't forward face with patients, but it just stock shelves. They gave it a name badge and it drives around. Nurses apparently loved it. They did very much what I saw people do in the Curie. Oh, isn't it so cute? It, it stocks my shelves. Your cobot partner already exists. In your career, right now, you'll be working with a robot. And if you're working at that new hospital, you are already on trajectory to be doing that. Because, you know, service drones, on the, that's tug on the right. Those exist all over the place. It's always a creepy looking bear robot from Japan. I, I won't lie. They just like their creepy looking Japan ro bear, uh, bear robots in Japan. Um, and Pepper, that's Humber River. They have a couple of them driving around out in Toronto. It's Pepper. You can go buy Pepper. It's a licensing fee to keep Pepper alive, but you can go buy her, and she like greets people and stuff. Social robots, service robots, co-robots, I don't care what you want to call them, they already exist, and they will be in your life. End stop. And I, this is just down the road. Now, this is, I thought was kind of funny. I appreciate it. This is a press release, so there's some media people behind this. But I want you to listen to the language was, which was used on this. You know, after 10 years, Jack the robot is preparing to retire. A member of the Vinci surgical team, Jack has assisted in his master's in more than 1,000 surgical procedures at VGH. While he has served the community well, Jack is becoming obsolete, and the time has come for a more advanced robot to take his place. Yeah, did, was that just a retirement ceremony for a robot? <laughs> that was. That was a retirement ceremony for a non-human agent. That's where we're at. You remember how I said our relationship with stuff is getting weird? We are now at this point where we're giving, and I tongue in cheek, I get, but still, this is a press release from last year. Will you be replaced by a computer? Well, this is Northeastern and um, Boston, they created a virtual discharge screen for nurses, where the virtual discharge screen is the nurse. Recall LaGuardia? I would check back up on this. This is from 2011. They've scaled it and they've retested it. They're doing an RCT as of 2018 on this virtual discharge screen, which also now is built into an app on your phone. So what does this all mean? Where are we going with this? What have I just talked about has been so normalized into your process because everything I've shown you currently exists? Everything I've shown you currently exists in the healthcare world, currently exists in the reality that we have somewhat just went meh to, and we're now at this place where we can't keep up. Who's in control of this? What is this foretelling of? As I talked to my a consultant in IBM Cloud Services about three years ago, two years ago, 
three months is the new calendar year. 2009 here is the front page of uh, Times talking about how you know, social media and Twitter is going to change the world and change the way we live to 2017, the front page of The Economist, social media is a threat to democracy. Oh, that's a, that's a fun time, 10 year, not even 10 year trajectory, where we go from the fun and rage of an innovative platform to connect and share to it being used to circumvent elections, democracy, sway, anger, infuriate, polarize. This is the place that we exist. So where are we going in the future with this background? Well, this is another, this is another KPMG um, think tank. And the funny part is this was published last year. And I can actually identify out of some of these boxes I'm going to show you with names, services that now exist that populate these domains. I couldn't last year. First one, healthcare on demand, proactive wellness. Well, Fitbit was just bought by Google, so, you know. Consumer held electronic medical records. Maple just teamed up with a third party company that just does that. They have a relationship. Maple now has its own medical record that's portable and owned by the patient. How many provinces and territories have tried to do this for decades? Companies now doing this for profit because it can. You have Internet of Things, enabled care anywhere. You have wearables and digestibles. That's starting to happen, I don't see too much. Precision medicine, that's a whole avenue on University Avenue down in Toronto, probably here too, in terms of using genetics to predict things that you should have in terms of treatments. Move on to the other side of the fence here. You have, um, it's really hard, augmented reality. Well, we heard a bunch of that today from you know, Bernie and others. Uh, Practice-based medicine in terms of big data kind of inverting on the you know, pragmatic randomized control trial or the gold standard in terms of generating knowledge from data that we currently have. Human augmentation in terms of implantables and things like that. Growing organs, that you see the odd news clips of those and the genetic treatments. The one I really quite enjoy doing thought exercise around is this hybrid workforce, the evolving relationship of humans and AI. Oh, kind of telling for this, eh? This is where we're at in terms of what is your relationship with your phone, which is essentially a robot powered by AI off in the distance. You have automation. You just saw the new hospital going there. It's full of automation. Like robots that drive things around all the way to the command center that probably has some crazy amounts of decision support in it to predict, to educate, to train, to prevent. It really makes your classical you know, medication errors literature look quite quaint after a while where it's like, did the person do their checks? When we have this kind of stuff coming up. We have medical drones, uh, Edmonton. Edmonton Airport is gonna be the first drone center for Canada, drone airport. I know I will live the day where Amazon delivers me a package via drone. Whether it's driving or flying, I don't know just yet, but I'm fairly certain I'll be delivered a package via drone. And then healthcare you know, environment, the, built, you know, the lab in Toronto that's owned by Google how people build houses. I was on the plane opening, you know, Air Canada thing where they have a magazine, you're bored of your mind because you're four and a half hours in, so you open up anything you can read. University of Alberta, smart seniors with the smart, the A and the I from the seniors highlighted to show the AI, talking about making smart environments for seniors, living environments. Other people are already in this. And like I said, if you were around the late 90s, you would know that these rules exist that you don't get in people's cars that are strangers because that's just not cool. That's how you disappear. And you don't meet people from the internet. I currently have a button on my phone now that I push and some person from the internet shows up and I jump in their car. <laughs> so if anything I've said up tonight, you're like, oh, Richard's just, I'm glad they keep them out at Western, man. Well, they do another. This was incomprehensible even 10 years ago. This is your everyday, and you've normalized it as just something that is given a shrug. Oh, yeah, Uber, it exists. I wonder what 2030 and 2040, what the one-liner punchline would be on those. So to use a metaphor from uh, the Matrix movies, which pill do you want to take? I've just given you some level of readjusting what your baseline was to the current day. Do you want to take the red pill or the blue pill? If you haven't seen the Matrix movie, none of this will make sense. If you have, you get where I'm going. The blue pill, well, you wake up tomorrow, you live a nice career, you do whatever you're doing. You forget everything I said, because, you know, just Richard, it's all good. And you just do whatever you need to. And you'll have a great life. You'll have a great career. Probably nothing materially will change in your life or work that much that will disrupt things. But since you've been here for the last 48 minutes, if you want to take the red pill, 
you can never go back because you now know what is ahead of you. You now know when someone comes up and glosses over about how technology can be so awesome that there's usually an underside that they're minimizing. And as you can see here, there's lots of great technology out there. But I've kind of backgrounded that a little bit to the things that are never spoken about. So it's up to you for which pill you want to take. Woolock in 1970 really started talking about this in an article where he said, are nurses ever going to be replaced? And the premise of that was automation and computers were coming. Now, she didn't have the vernacular back then that we do now in terms of all the stuff I talked about. So the computer is this big, I stand out with like monolithic technology. It means everything. So she put down two potential trajectories for the profession. One in which we revi uh, revise and redefine how nurses are prepared to practice in the future. I'm going to advocate we do that. And if we renege, the second course and trajectory here is that we become replaced by the, tech, by the computer and paramedicals will fill nursing-related roles. I think her prediction is right on trajectory. That replacement by paramedicals, skill mixture, anyone, um, has already started to occur. For right or for wrong, I'll leave you to think about that one. Replacement by the computer, which is synonymous for anything I've just talked about today in terms of automation, augmentation, what have you, that's there too. 1970. Where are we going? Now, I appreciate I'm at UBC right now, and equity and social justice is a big thing. All of this stuff I'm talking about is just not equitable at all. I'm not even going to try. Just not going to. It could be. Probably not going to be. It's just going to exacerbate inequities. A ton of opportunities going to come for it. A ton of opportunities for people who can reap the benefits. But it's going to generate so much inequity, it's not even funny. And you start looking at the things like, the last couple of years especially, this, the top one was a, um, a nice recent report from employees in a warehouse. And they found that working with cobots and automation really didn't like, replace people. It just made people's lives miserable because it made them work harder and faster. Yeah. Didn't replace whole scale. It replaced people, don't get me wrong. But it didn't replace everyone. It just made the workers' lives more miserable because now they could go faster and harder and maximize whatever KPI they were trying to derive from the human labor. And you want to start talking about where things are going with that. When we start automating inequities, just like any classical informatics thing, you automate a bad process, you just make it worse. Well, it's not just process anymore. It's not just punching widgets, doing things. We're now automating social justice, inequities into the fabric of these systems, which we have no clue how they work. Right? It's a big black box, like, oh, the computer says I should do this. I don't really understand how it came up with that, and I've normalized all the behaviors and patterns to get to this point, so I'll just go with it. Because you know, there's facial recognition technology for interviews that currently exists. It's just not going to work for some people, because some people just, my, my dad would fail horribly. Like, he just, he never smiles. He has no, no transference at all. It's just, it's just flat all the time. He would be very, very poorly received by a technology that wants to see a happy, warm person that's searching for that. The gig economy, you want to look at things like Maple, you have like physicians and MPs who are taking up gig work. You know, it's no longer just full-time shift work. And from that report in the warehouse, this is the one sentence in the paragraph that really stood out to me. This research suggests that, however, that even though some technologies promise to alleviate the need for the most arduous activities, this will be coupled with attempts to increase the pace of work, productivity, and other tasks, which new methods of motivating and monitor workers. So, all the times you hear really glowing technology, you think this technology is going to give us more time for patients. Okay, what's the policy after that that protects that time that was gained? You never hear about that, right? That's where all you need to step up and make sure that there's policy that once you get a gain from some sort of augmentation, automation, whatever technology gives you benefits to really encompass that nursing role, that there's stuff behind it to protect it because I guarantee it, it will be taken away to increase some sort of KPI metric thing that speaks to a bottom line that probably isn't the patient or the nursing profession. So what do we do? I've talked a lot about the current state. I've reset your baseline, I hope at least. Some of you might have already known about all this stuff. If you had, great. It's confirmatory. If you didn't, you now have a new baseline of normalization. Where do we go with all this? Davenport and Kirby in 2016 in their book, The hum Only Humans Need Apply, very optimistic book, I have to give you, uh, kind of in interpretation of automation and AI. They recommend a pile of things in their logic model in terms of taking groups or individuals and being able to see the future and move it forward. I'm only going to focus on the first step 
because there's no point talking about the rest of them because we're at the first step. We're not even close to the second step. We're just at the first step, which is step up. And they define it as identifying opportunities for automation and determining which tasks will be done by computers and which tasks will be done by humans. That's actually my post-tenure book. Now that I have tenure, I'm going to write that book. What things in nursing uh, could probably go away and be automated? I appreciate that's almost sacrilegious, but we need that kind of future forward to say that's that we've been doing for the last 50 years. While we really like it, probably isn't worth our price point and our knowledge. The second part is to notice if the world has changed, but the systems haven't. Well, the last 54 minutes, I hope I've demonstrated to you that the world has very much changed. You saw at the new hospital for the people who are here for the presentation that hospitals have changed, healthcare has changed, but I'm going to suggest probably not at the same rate that a lot of stuff I've just talked about. This is where we come in. We need to notice when the world changes. We need to respond accordingly in a unified fashion, because if we don't, well, we're never going to get the first step of step up going. And really, my main message coming out of all this is we just need to do three things to stay on top of this. And we're never going to stay at the bleeding edge of it. We can't. Just, it's just not going to happen. But we do need to step up, leverage, and become stewards of technology for both patients and the profession. We need to. We need to understand when trends change and react to them, not hold on to some sort of traditional classical interpretation of what we really liked 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, or was written about something pre-digital everything, because it makes us feel good. That's a poor strategy for longevity. That's a poor competitive advantage. We live in a world where those words just don't matter anymore. We need to reinforce the human element, because, well, that's getting lost. That's where we have strengths in. That's where pretty much all our literature exists within. How are we going to take that body, how are we going to take that knowledge and amplify it into the world that we need to go? To build the vision for the future human technical relationship. So like that eMERGE nurse who is, you know, robots don't think, they use algorithms. Yes, they do. Let's move that thought one step forward. What is your new relationship? I don't care if you don't like it. What is your new relationship with that? How are you going to be a change agent to shape that technology, good or bad, to help you, to augment you, to amplify you, not to remain in the current state model of care that probably is becoming obsolete by the day. So this is my daughter when she was three years old. She's about five and a half now. She loves Frozen, and I'm not going to lie, the upcoming Frozen 2 is a big deal in her life. She got Frozen socks on, she got a Frozen sticker board, uh, she got Frozen pictures in the background, and she named our robot Elsa, the vacuum cleaner robot. She put a sticker of Elsa on it. Elsa, while a robot, is still Elsa. It drives around, it falls off the stairs every once in a while. It's a pretty dumb robot, but she sees personality in it. She cares for it. She carries it around, picks it up, rescues it when it gets stuck. It's Elza to her. And the more I think about this, because I do research on my family because ethics won't let me at Western because I don't know where a lot of this data goes. <laughs> so I just subject my family to it from a protocol perspective to kind of figure out from a quality improvement where I'm going. Um, there's, G there, there's Curie there. Some of you probably met out there in my other one. Uh, the middle picture, she asked Jibo, this HAL 9000 orb looking robot on the right, to take a picture of her. So it did. She befriended that robot in a matter of days and got to like it, to ask it jokes. It disrupted our family meals. I wrote a Shirk's whole proposal on how a social robot can mess up your family. And they funded it, funny enough. <laughs> because this non human thing has agency, it has presence. It befriended my children. And you know what the terrifying thing is? Or not terrifying. This is normalized into her baseline. She's never going to know a world where a robot like this can't exist. And she will grow up in a world where she'll look back and go, of course robots have always been around. Why are you so amazed and why are you following around that security robot? Because it will always have existed to her. And when I told her that I was going to bring Jibo, this machine on the right, which is actually the company went out of business, I had to bring it back to play with the other robots at work. She said, I'm going to be sad when you bring Jibo to work to play with the other robots. Remember Kate Darling in that TED video I said, Jesse, you have a look at? You build emotional connections to things that are not human, whether you want to or not. So as we look into the future, what is our nursing relationship going to be? Where are we going to go? How are we going to get to the top of the mountain? in a productive, proactive fashion that keeps us future thinking, that protects the values of patients, that respects social justice, 
that doesn't automate stuff and that is just poor for the longevity of the profession or the care of clients. We need to make some decisions. All of you tonight need to make some decisions. You've already made a decision. Well, you took the red pill, didn't dive right in, or you're going to wake up tomorrow with the blue pill and just continue on. For those who took the red pill, make some decisions. Because if no one comes from the future to tell you it's a bad thing, then you're good to go. You now have a new baseline to make decisions, to inform your research, to inform your practice, to inform your leadership, to inform things that can change into the future. You will plant the seeds for 5 to 10 to 15 years. You will plant the seeds for people like my daughter to have health care that you would want them to see, not a company that devised a new algorithm to provide her care without our voice added to it. So our big decisions that we have are looming for us. They are way easier to take the blue pill, <laughs> cover it up, walk away. Big values, big decisions, big places to go. But if you haven't gathered, my message today is that we need to collectively stand together to think about things that we want to have move into the future, things that we want to prevent, things that we want to hold on to dear, things that we want to augment, things that we want to automate, things that we want to give away, and things that we want to hold on for life, for dear, for the profession, and the care of patients. And I'm going to suggest, once again, as closing, that the best way to do this and to predict the future is for all of us to rally together and co-create it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that we've got some questions. We've got around 15, 20 minutes for, to take some questions for Richard. There's uh, an enormous amount of information there and uh, some really thought-provoking pieces. So who'd like to start us out? The microphone's on both sides. I'm going to ask a question then, just while people are coming up to the microphones. So is the red pill a one-time pill? <laughs> and what if I take the red pill and then I maybe change my mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Well, I guess we go back to the movie, once you take the pill, you go down that tube thing and then you're, you're out, right? So, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I would suggest that once you go down this pathway, you can't really come back because now you're never going to look at your phone the same way. You're never going to jump in your car and go, oh, it connected with my car. That's nice of it. You're never going to look at that, that seamless connection the same way. You're never going to walk into a Best Buy and go, I could really use that X, Y, Z Internet of Things device. I don't know how it connects or how it knows I'm home, you're never going to think of that the same way. Once you take this pill and go down that rabbit hole, you can never unsee what we've talked about. And I think that's important because up to this point, you've normalized all that stuff into your current life. And you've been subjected likely to pretty much everything I've mentioned tonight, knowingly or not, in the course of the last couple of years. You're all going to probably end up taking the red pill. I think we've got a question here. Come down. If there was something cataclysmic like uh, solar flares or mm -hmm. an asteroid that falls um, from a, a shower of asteroids, what would the plan B be? And <laughs> the second comment or question would be about the, the quote about if there was no person from the future. Mm -hmm. it, it seems awfully passive and I guess, um, well, sure. carry from there. Okay, so first is um, some sort of really poor, bad event, like a solar flare, some sort of grid thing going down where we kind of revert to Stone Age overnight, instantly. Uh, that's, a, that's, you know, if you go into some of the emergency preparedness literature, um, that is a material concern. And I, I don't want to ever deny the fact, whether that's going to happen or not, questionable, could, but... I would like to think that we're resilient enough as a species that would be okay. And honestly, it would probably be a reset button to a lot of this stuff that's come kind of uncontrolled. Um, beyond getting down the rabbit hole of some tinfoil and some prepping talk, talk um, not really exactly sure I can answer that. I think 
civilization will continue onwards regardless of whether you know the power grid goes down. Would it be a disruption to all this stuff? Of course it would. Um, but I think we would be resilient. The second part is the pass uh, passivity in terms of if no one comes in the future to stop you. Uh, really kind of what I meant with that is we just need to make decisions and we need to be proactive. And it was kind of done in jest that, you know, I'm fairly certain no one from the future is going to come. It would be kind of cool if they did, but I don't think they're going to. Um, and we just need to be proactive to do things. Um, we need to think about where we are at right now and make decisions and move forward and become active in this domain. Because this domain covers over every topic conceivable that anyone would be interested in. It supersedes society and healthcare. It definitely supersedes our profession. It is the umbrella that really is encapsulating us at the moment. And it's just going to become more normalized if we don't. So I hope that helps a bit, but uh, I appreciate it. I can't really address the first question as much as I'd like. Thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, given what you're talking about and the extent to which, as you say, especially the ways that technology is, is currently set to actually um, exacerbate inequality, to actually make the inequality that we're fighting to reduce um, stronger um, or, or deeper, it occurs to me that as much as we maybe need to be preparing our nursing students um, for engaging with technology and helping to inform and direct technology in ways that um, protect sort of the, the, and ensure that it's actually benefiting patients, we also need to ensure that our education actually takes um, an ethical look and challenges the ethics of technology. Oh, yeah. um, I've seen some of that happening um, with colleagues like um, Dr. Rachel Walker, Walker at, at um, um, University of Amherst, um, at University of Massachusetts Amherst, who's talking about how algorithms are actually baking in further mm -hmm. inequality and ways that digital technology needs to be sort of confronted mm -hmm. and ways that you can actually create equity into some of the AI. So in thinking about where do we need to go as a profession um, around the ethics or the moral portions of, of mm -hmm. that might be absent at the moment with sort of a capitalist approach, what would you recommend in uh, thinking about this? So there's a couple different strategies. I think the embedded nature where any course you teach which should probably have some sort of social justice or ethics lens to it, starts to speak about this. We just need to bring it to the forefront because when we start thinking about like social justice and equity in a 1.0 lens, it's like some policy actor does X, Y, Z over time. But now we, we're just programming that into something. As you can see in the last five years, how much change we've had. So it's just a great contemporary. It didn't make the cut here, but Steven, Steve Wojak, the uh, co-founder of Apple, when Apple Card came out, him and his wife who have shared assets applied for this new credit card. He got 10 times the limit as his wife did. Like insurance, health, money, access, all that stuff is being processed into an algorithm and predicted for you. I'm going to even suggest things like medication administration, like th all that. And I think having ethics courses, robot ethics, like Kate Darling does, and probably getting deeper into data ethics is something that we really need to think of. And I think every course, pretty much that's taught, can start to think about that, can start to add it, because it's becoming especially from a research perspective, a really quite important thing. Um, we have, we just put a big grant in where we're gonna create a petabyte of data over about three or four years. Like, a, like research ethics protocols, not gonna even come close to the data governance that we're gonna need for this crazy volume of data. And we're gonna machine learn that. And I'm sitting back going, so what kind of inequities are we gonna, are we gonna bury in here that I'm not gonna find for 10 years? So having that in advance, is going to be well more important than the current trajectory where we're finding it out after the fact. Hope that helps a bit. Thank you. Hello. Thank you uh, so much for your presentation. This is definitely one of my areas of interest. Um, I come from a family of computer programmers, but I'm a nurse by background. 
when we think about training the next generation of health professionals or even training the current generations of health professionals to have expertise in things like supervised learning, unsupervised learning for training neural networks, or even the process of gradient descent. How do you think we should best tackle that so that nurses and health professionals maintain some ownership about mm -hmm. how the, these technologies are integrated mm -hmm. into healthcare systems and our society? So I have one way, and there's probably many others, but this is the thing that I've been advocating. When I have that student, who's typically a third or fourth year undergrad student, stumble into my office and go, I wanna do something kind of like what you said, or some sliver of it. And it's funny, because I have about two or three former students right now helping with the implementation across the street in that new CERN platform. So I know the outcome is starting to occur. I suggest you take your nursing degree, your clinical background, and you hybridize that with a different profession. You become, and you go play in the uncontested space where nursing hasn't played, by getting other training and other education where you can utilize your nursing skills and amplify the nursing role. So whether it be the classical health informatics, or some of the data science or the machine and AI, which are now starting to brew up as professions and domains of research and expertise you can gain. I'm, I'm all for a fan of taking your nursing background and hybridizing that with engineering, comp, sci, whatever it might be, to complete, to complete and create the competitive advantage for the profession so we can be at the table with a voice who understands enough of the domains. That's what I suggest. My kind of touches on this. Sure. Sorry, that on. Um, as Cerner becomes live, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a precipice right here in um, electronic healthcare because at the moment everything is very much paper based, mm -hmm. faxes, photocopy machine, and Cerner is going to become live at St. Paul's like in a few days. Mm -hmm. How do you see the sort of electronic healthcare data security impact? Because I think that's a risk that you maybe haven't touched on. Yeah, I, I didn't <laughs> purposely because. Wanted to go down the road. All that stuff is very important. I don't want to ever minimize, you know, data governance and security and cybersecurity, which I think there's no less than a dozen different municipalities in one territory that's currently being held hostage right now in Canada by cybersecurity threats. Um, it's super important. The more we digitize, the more risk. And it used to be when like a data breach would occur, there would be like a wide scale media reaction. Now people go, meh. Like that's the, the reaction that we're starting to see now. That's the normalization of this occurring. Is it good? No. Do I have a direct answer for your question? I wish I did. I don't, but what I am going to turn it back on, this is full on prof material here, right? I'm gonna turn this back on. You know this is an issue. You know this is a potential. You know where you're at in your career and what you want to see have happen for your clients. This is your rally cry to go out, get the expertise and to become that data steward, become that data expert in governance, in management, in cybersecurity, so you can build the system, help refine the system, protect it. Allowing other people to do it, well, we've had about 30 years of informatics literature to suggest that probably doesn't work out well for us, because now we're reaping the benefits of the systems that weren't designed by us, or at least, well, collaboratively designed or co-designed. They were just designed for us, not with us. We now live in a place where we have a critical mass. This topic is a topic. Love that. Like this topic is a topic now. I, I, Lynn Nagel, Catherine Hannah, they've been banging this drum for decades. And only now do I get to reap the normalized benefits of this being a domain that I can talk about and have people wanting to hear about it. So that's my, that's my rally cry for you. If you see this as a super important thing, this I want you to make your life career. And believe me, you will never be for lack of employment. Thank you. I'm, my head is just not moving fast enough to get get around all of this, but I'm I'm really struck by the um, unconscious normalization of all of this and the argument you're making for the permanent changes in the human condition. And I mean, I can remember when we first had computerized access to information instead of looking up an old encyclopedia, for example. And we, of, of course, we've changed with regard to information. So as as we change, how are we going to deal with these fundamental ideas like patient-centered care that have always been so central to mm -hmm. nursing if the patients themselves are starting to shift in a way that they no longer know what they need? Yeah. It's very worrisome. Oh, it is. And that's, that's, a, that's a really great insight because it's not just normalization of us. It's everyone, right? Like your family member, your, your grandpa can't keep up. Your kid can't keep up. We're all living in this domain where keeping up is not even yeah. something that we can entertain. So 
things like patient-centered care, things that patients should want for themselves, essentially being told. They're being yeah. told by third parties. At what, that, point do we, at what point do we know that they've lost control over uh, what they want for themselves, though? At what point are the machines winning? I wish I knew. <laughs> I really do. This is, like, honestly, this is the things that kind of keep, like, people, like, you stay up at night over this. I'm like, I do, because I think about my five-and-a-half-year-old, my two-and-a-half-year-old. This is now the world. I was talking to a few people prior to the presentation. They will now have to grapple with existential questions that I could not even put into a sentence five years ago. That will be their professional domains. And you want to you talk about something I didn't mention about the Gen um, Zetters? They will now have to compete against machines and AI for competitive advantages in their careers. Everyone sitting in this room right now has only had to compete against persons sitting left or right, compete against people. Your new generation of kids will have to compete against non-human things for advantage, for career, for trajectory. This is the current stage world that we live in, which is why I'm gonna suggest that red pill is something that we all need to take. Because sitting back, being idle, is definitely not gonna be prosperous for the future. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And when we are talking about uh, healthcare technologies, I kind of, I kind of realize that these technologies are produced by tech companies, which mostly is to maximize profit. And as nurses, what role can we play in co-creating these technologies to make sure that they remain relevant to us? Yep. No, that's a fantastic question. And I'm, I try not to be too, too critical of my vendor colleagues, because I've got a lot of them. I've actually kind of technically worked as one for a while as a consultant. You know, you got to pay the mortgage, right? So it's one of these things where I take a step back, and I appreciate there are vested interests, there are vested values, and there's different pathways to what people see. But collectively as a profession, we have a lot of people, like I said, I have two individuals right now who are in the private sector who are helping out with that Cerner implementation. At least two, if not more. And it's one of these things where I have to take a step back and go, at least we got a colleague out there, <laughs> right? Because 10, 15, 20 years ago, we didn't. So how are we gonna negotiate these relationships? We need to essentially just be everywhere. You need to be able to speak the language, you need to have the connections, and you have to understand that there's going to be value systems and how you work with those values. There is definitely a place for the private sector, there's definitely a place for vendors, because without them, we would not generate the innovation quick enough within ourselves to do anything functional, let's be honest about that. We're gonna need those sectors, but we also need to rein them in. Best way to rein them in is policy. I got some policy colleagues in this audience right now, so you know how fast that moves. That's where we need to be in the place for. We need to do things that we have a locus of control over. And we only do that if we take the red pill. Does that work? Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. So I totally swallowed that red pill years ago. Okay, good. This is what my husband and I talk about when we spend evenings together. Mm -hmm. um, but nurses are a different breed. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on a project trying to incorporate technology into the operating room in mm -hmm. order to prevent retained surgical items. So really important, but I'm getting a really hard time getting nurses to buy into this. Mm -hmm. So just, just so you know, I was in the operating room when that new robot yeah. came oh, in. Great. And fine, it, it was kind of lackluster, yep. to be honest. It took seven years to get this new robot, and the, the new robot had one less wire, which is great. It had, it was a little bit smaller, which mm -hmm. is nice. Um, and we're just now getting, getting uh, computer charting. Mm -hmm. How long have the states been doing computer charting? Forever. Mm -hmm. I talked to my colleagues in the states and they've been doing this for as long as they can remember, mm -hmm. right? So it's really hard to get nurses to buy into this, partly because we're really slow at taking on technology. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question for you is, how do we get nurses to buy into this? One, for a selfish reason, because I need to know so for, <laughs> my own, for my own work. Yeah. But two, this is the future. And um, I'm, I'm here with my colleagues from BCIT. Mm -hmm. um, and we teach nurses. Yeah. So uh, what's uh, next? I, I really wish I had a, a panacea, something I could just say that would just fix all, and I don't. Like I've, we've, I've looked at the adoption literature of technology. It hasn't honestly changed that much. I uh, Ways of doing things, technology change. But the slowness the cumbersomeness, the clunkiness, that hasn't gone away. I can only hope 
that as we move forward and familiarity with technology becomes more you know, built into it, as we evolve undergrad curriculums and our education processes, I'm really lucky at Western, we have a health informatics and nursing requisite course that every second year we'll take. And we're doing that for the graduate program soon too, where you will take health informatics. Now, it's still health informatics. It's not the stuff really, that, well, a bit of the stuff, but nowhere even close. It's your more classical cause and informatics competencies that we're ensuring that we really get a good dose of. I'm hopeful with that kind of proactivity that over a couple generations, well, not a couple, a couple decades, we'll have a critical mass. Unfortunately, there's nothing that, like I said, it will make it move any faster at this point. We need to, with the knowledge that you might have regained as a new baseline, really just be the change agents and be the champion of it in a measured, proactive way. Because not all change is good, and if there's resistance to something, there's usually a pretty good reason there's resistance to it. So. I never want to come up as the technology optimist at any given. As people who know me, I'm a defensive pessimist. I always plan for failure. <laughs> Hence why I have my slides here and a cup of water. In case things go south, I want to have a backup. And this is where we need to be with at technology. Any rosy, idealistic interpretation that you're fed from now on, I want you to go, <laughs> okay, let's make sure we know what to do when it fails. And if you plan that way, then you might actually see some adoption because you'll have built-in strategies to back end when something doesn't go the way you want it to. But once again, I wish there was a fix, but you know what? You could be that fix moving into the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again, Richard. Uh, really thought-provoking. Richard's around uh, tomorrow and, and I'm sure you're reachable electronically. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just saying. So. Um, uh, please join me in thanking Richard. Um, fantastic. <laughs> I'd like to um, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. A couple of just a, a couple of thank yous. Uh, Merrily, who leads this uh, the organisation of this every year and does a terrific job. Uh, shout out to her. Um, it's been great working with her over the last three years and uh, this is my finale but uh, she will no doubt continue on so a special shout out to, to Marilee. Heather, uh, thank you so much for your help today and, and getting us set up and Chandra for driving us in and getting us parked and uh, greeting people who are coming along and to you guys for, for coming out tonight. Um, really, really thought provoking, great engagement. Um, one final thing, shameless self-promotion here. This is, this is a book and this is um, not, you can get it electronically, but we do have a paper copy. <laughs> Probably shouldn't say that, should I? But anyway, they're outside. This is the research report for this year, just released today. There's some real high points in here and we've got some left from last year and you can get them <laughs> as a bundle. Now that's two things together. Now you have to carry them home or else you can wait till you get home and download them. They're great read. Um, really encourage you to download it as quickly as you can. Thanks very much and see you next year. <laughs> <laughs>